And for all of your presentations, you're going to need to source some data. So today's subject, how to find data. So we'll cover a few little points like where do you go? How can you find, where would you go to find data? Some of you have already found some fun stuff. I've seen one or two really interesting stuff. And I know that one or two of you have come up with some rather challenging, very large sets of data, like 14,000 columns of data. Now that is innovative, that's giving yourselves a really good challenge which, from which everyone here, and me, and Moson, can learn lots. Some of that, what you're going to do in your presentations, might be so interesting that when most and I see the presentations or review them afterwards, we'll probably come and ask you if we can take those presentations and actually post them up on the web as examples of brilliant capability. And I'll show you where we'll be doing that. And if you want to do, go one step further, we'll run a session or two with a video camera, you can practice, and do a little 10 minute video presentation, talking to camera with it in the background, there's slides in the background, and then we can put them up on a YouTube channel of are interesting ways of doing things with SAS. And of course, that goes on your CV. Now, how many undergraduates are going to go by the middle of next semester <coughs> as you start um, applying for your jobs for your placement year, are going to have videos on YouTube of cool, clever things to do with SAS? SAS are already interested, very, very excited about a, data, a website that most and I and other colleagues around the world are building. I'll show it to you in a minute. And they want to work with us to build it to be the big data and analytics resource, educational research resources website in the world. Hosted here from Derby. And you can get your name on the contributors list, you can get your name there, can actually providing contributions, clever ways of coding, clever ways of doing things. That's what we are giving you the opportunity to really signpost the sort of things that you're doing, that we're doing, that'll help you to get really great placements. So, then the second part is exploring data. How, what do you do with the data once you've found something on the World Bank site or wherever? And as you explore the data, the next thing is, okay, data is just data. It's just bits and bytes, ones and zeros, ultimately. It's mapped into <coughs> numbers and letters and spaces and characters when you put a format on it. And then it's given a little bit more, under, or we get more understanding as you put column labels and definitions of what the columns are about. And then you can start doing some interesting things. And you can start thinking about, okay, what's the source of the data? Who created it? What was their purpose in creating it or capturing the data? And then, who might want to use it? Who's a stakeholder who might want to ask questions of that chunk of data and come up with some really interesting and very valuable answers, what we call insights? And that's what it's all about, what big data analytics is about, is finding those interesting questions. That's why I teach you questions, not answers. I teach you how to find questions. You need to connect the data to your understanding of that particular field. So as you do go through your next two or three years, and you go and look for places to get data, you go and look for data sets, always remember, you will find it more interesting to do the sort of challenges we give you if the data is something that's interesting to you. So maybe some, and I know one or two people, and I can't remember if it's this year or next year, or the final year, are already looking at sort of data about basketball. Others are looking at data, uh, the final year students last semester, one of them thought it would be interesting to look at crime statistics from the police in Ripley for Derbyshire and Derby City, and see if there's any connection, because it's location based, 
to where the um, CCTV cameras are, are posted around Derby. Because there's a data set that you can get from the Derby City Council that says where every single lamppost and every single CCTV is by latitude and longitude. And she thought it'd be rather fun to pull all this together and see if there are any connections between the data. Because she was interested in it for a variety of personal and other reasons. So it meant something to her, and therefore she invested a lot more effort in doing the job, and she got a great grade. And so I would encourage all of you, whether it's for these little exercises, for presentations, or for the little system you're going to create a bit later on in the semester, what you're going to do next year and the year after, think about finding data that's really interesting to you. I mean, think back to what you did with your article for ICS. Almost every single one of you chose a topic that meant something to you individually. And many of you got really good results because it was something that's interesting. I want to find out more about it. Use that principle as you go through all of your data analytics activities. Choose data that's really interesting to your own personal interests. Because that will allow you to get much more enthusiastic and, in, and develop or devote a lot more time to doing the work. So, where to start, how to explore the data, what sort of questions might you want to ask. Here's a little list, these are hot links, so you can actually link, uh, click on those and jump to them. This is the one I was going to mention to you. This is our website that we are now creating. <coughs> it's only just got started. There are about five or six academics around the world who are all beginning to contribute to it. Explore all of these links as we go along. You can contribute in some of these areas by sending me the link or a little web a webcam you want to put up there, or you know you might do a little um, talk to your smartphone to record a little video. You know, all of these sort of things, we can start thinking about putting them up into here onto our YouTube channel. Um, and I was showing some of the others earlier on. If we look at this one, this page, various different sectors, <coughs> sections that we're beginning to start populating. Um, if we look at application, oh no, sorry, let's go back, go back, go back. Major analytics vendors, we've got some stuff relating to the work we're doing with IBM and the sort of interesting topics we've got there. And we've also got SAS. You already know about those two links, but this one is an interesting link. He, this guy who does it, Robert Allison, is a SAS expert. He's a real great expert, and this website has something like 90 pages, each of which has about a dozen different ways of visualizing data. Not only can you see the type of graph or picture that it creates, but he also gives you the code. Now, be careful. If you want to use some of that for your presentation, then a couple of things I'd say. One, you might want to use the principle on other data. So, Please don't copy-paste, interpret it and amend it, but give the citation, the reference, to where you found it in there. And this is something you're going to need to think about as you go through the next three years. You're going to find and learn how to find more and more how-to advice on the internet. So we're going to expect you to go out onto the internet to find the techniques to find the types of code that will help you to do really interesting things. So if you do copy-paste a chunk of code, for goodness sake, A, give the citation, but more importantly, you need to understand why that chunk of code does what it does. And there's huge amounts of stuff in here that you will need to understand what it does, why it does what it does. Otherwise, it's pointless. Over the next two, three years, you need to be able to understand how your, code, your systems actually do their work. 
once you get out into the big wide world, yeah, use those resources, copy paste, yeah, give a little bit of a, a credit to where it comes from in your code libraries. But you might not need to worry quite so much about why does it do what it do, does, it just does what I need it to do. But for the next three years, you must understand the code that you are using. Otherwise, you will be edging into that terrible territory of plagiarism. And code that you use which you do not understand, we will probably detect it fairly quickly by talking to you <coughs> as you do things. And then, if you haven't got the citation, if you haven't got the credits in there, bang! You've got an interesting and difficult discussion with Mosin, with me or other colleagues, and you may find your grades get reduced considerably. Depend on what we say you can, can and can't do, but for, to, for this semester, you must understand the code. So it's all very well in, say, you pick up some SG plots or the code ideas from here, perhaps, you bump it in there, you give your presentation, and we ask the question, why does it do what it's doing? And you go, blah, 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 don't know, it just does it. Wrong answer, folks. So, that's a little bit, explore that website. And any great ideas that come from you guys, will be add, your name will be added into here which is going to be good for your CV, it's going to be good for your interviews if you're going for SAS or analytics type of jobs uh, for your placement year. It'll be good for you when you go and apply for jobs in a couple of years' time. I help to contribute stuff to here, and this is the bit that I contributed. Can I say something here? In fact, today we were uh, in a meeting, and I'm sorry, I'm a bit late, um, we had a meeting today with a good number of uh, small to medium company, uh, companies um, within Derby and the surroundings. And what they asked for is, do you have students who can do the job for short periods of time? Uh, why short periods of time? Because usually companies will not give you two years to develop all they have is six weeks, 12 weeks, something short like that. And when I told them that we have the talents to do, uh, you know, visualization and SAS kind of uh, 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 data manipulation, they were excited. And they basically said, we'd like to see those. In fact, next week we will have possibly a meeting with one company who will tell us actually what kind of requirements they have for, product, for, for projects as well as people that they would like to hire. Maybe during the summer, with the little you know, knowledge that you have, you can earn a good amount of money to support your summer. So that would be a good thing to do. Sorry. Lovely, thanks. Yeah. yeah. So, a few places there, and a whole lot more places on that page in the Big Data Res um, Resources website. You can, one of the simplest ways as you're using SAS is just suck the data in either in file, you, if you're reading it from a, um, a text file or CSV, or you can use uh, importing if it's an Excel spreadsheet, lots of different ways, and no doubt some you're going to tell us a little bit of interesting stuff today. And then, do a little bit of exploration using a proc, some of the proc steps. Um, you can also use, do it in Excel if the stuff is already in a spreadsheet. You've, a very simple exploration is sometimes quite useful. Think about sequencing or use JMP, jump. It's in there. If you've got an Excel spreadsheet, downstairs in the labs, you'll see on the menu bar across the top, uh, it says JMP, which is a SAS derivative, and it's an incredibly powerful environment. So I don't care what you use, whether you use Jump or whether you use Excel or SAS, preferably this one because that's what you're learning today, or this term. Find different ways. See what it, the data is. One of the things that I always used to do when I was working with Royce 
and they're doing this sort of work. Got a new file, 20, 30, 40, 50 variables, and some of them were, the titles seem to make them interesting, project identification perhaps, project ID. First thing to do was to then, okay, what are the values in there? Proc freak on that column. And then you always found the ones you expected, blah, 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 blah. And then you'd find some rather interesting ones. 99999. That's interesting. ZZZZZ. That's funny. And there's six of those and ten of the 999s. You go to the people who own the data and they say, ah, yes, Richard. Um, that was because we couldn't get a quick mod for the system to add another column or to change the validation. So we just fudged, we could just squeeze in Z, 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 Z. And it means, and then they tell you exactly what project it meant. This is because you know, it's very difficult sometimes to modify systems. And so you will find lots of dirty data sitting in there. Well, that's tomorrow, next week's session, isn't it? Cleansing data. Find out what's in the columns. Do a proc freak or something like that to find out the list of all of the things in there, the letter, the words or what have you, the numbers perhaps, and then see what looks sensible, find out those ones which look very, very odd, and maybe you just dump those records. Who knows? You've got to determine that. And then you've got to start thinking about, okay, well I've got this, I've now started thinking of cleaning it up perhaps. What questions do I need to ask? What can the data tell me? But then, just as importantly, and this becomes very, very important in business, because the guys at the top, of the people at the top of the business, the executives, often have a problem to solve. They want to get insights, and they do not want the answer, no, you can't do that. They don't like that one somehow. But it is absolutely crucial in terms of information governance and big data governance that you actually are very clear in your understanding of what cannot be asked of the data or what cannot be answered by the data. Oh, yeah. What cannot be answered by the data that I have here. Some of it is easy. That one often is quite easy. That one, humans don't like to worry about that one too much because it means it's constraining me from doing what I want to do. That one leads you to the next question. Do I need other information? Do I need other data that I can connect to the data I've already got? And that's why the little system you're building towards the end of term requires at least two data sets that you're going to be able to pull together and connect together somehow. So that you've got extra data that gives you answers to the thing that isn't answered, perhaps. Then you have to think about who the stakeholders are that you're doing the work for. And there's an interesting question here. When we do these analyses, we tend to get sucked in, and you will get sucked into your data because there's lots of it there. Lots and lots of information. And you can chart it and you can do statistics of all sorts. And if you've got lots of data in SAS and you do, say, I don't know, prop means or you do one of the statistical functions, say, the prop t test, it will produce you tens or hundreds of pages of data, vast numbers of graphs of all sorts of shapes and sizes, and you've got a fabulous amount of data there. What you have to do then is to think, okay, the stakeholder, my audience, the people I'm providing this presentation for, what are they interested in? What is going to connect with them? Because you've got to, re we go back to the guidelines for cre creating presentations that we've you've covered a couple of times now. What do I want to say, well, that's all that thousand pages of graphs and so on I just got from property test. Ah, that's a problem. What do I need to say to my audience? Two pages, three graphs, perhaps. 
and one little table of data. So this is where you bring into your thinking the audience, the stakeholder who's up posed the question to you, or in most of the examples we're going to be doing over the next two, three years, what should they be interested in, or what might they be interested in, pare it down to the very barest minimum. I want to answer that to the people who I'm planning to uh, answer, uh, give answers to, and so on. Which itself has a very interesting term that I think I have been using over the past three weeks because I fell in love with it, and that is storytelling. Storytelling is basically what your management is interested in knowing. So, there's a problem, but you want to make a presentation for a certain aspect of that problem that is your problem domain. The question is not to throw numbers at them or graphs like pi or lines or something like that. What you need to do is tell them a story from the beginning till the end. And this is the subject of all these five or six points. Put that in mind because this is the guts of big data. Now, what we need to share with people. And as you do your presentations, as you develop, and you know, the, the guys who are presenting today, you know, it's the first time, you're going to learn a lot from your colleagues and from what they're doing. And they're going to learn from each other. So, there, the six groups who are going to present today are going to learn a lot about what they need to do for the sec their second presentation. That's why we're running two sets, each of you are doing two presentations. One, as a practice, develop your ideas, develop your skills, develop your storytelling, and then the assessed one later on in the term, in two or three weeks time, depending when your second one is, yeah, you will have learned from everybody, and you will be doing a lot better. So you've got one session which is kind of no pain, but hopefully lots of gain. And then you've got the one where you've learnt from each other, and that's one we're going to be assessing, that most and I will assess. And you guys are going to contribute to that as well, because you are the audience. You're the guys who are trying to learn from each other based on these presentations. So one thing, we aren't going to do this now, but this is something that all of you are going to need to do over the next week. So, Starting, I think, this week, we're going to be giving um, some little activities on each of our presentations, both in mind presentations, and you are each going to give some examples of some of this as part of your presentation that you're going to be doing over the next few weeks. And like I said earlier on downstairs, there's a blog environment or some sort of discussion board environment on the website, on Blackboard, for this module. You will now start posting your presentations up there so that everyone can share them. So everyone can see what the, the little tasks are, something like that, at the last slide perhaps, and you can start practicing it. Because remember, to do well in this environment, you have to immerse yourselves completely in SAS for probably 10 or 12 hours a week for the rest of the semester. If you do that, you are going, by the end of this semester, to be really great. You've done your 30-odd hours worth of work on the 20 chapters, most of you. Many of you have got 10 out of 10 for all four tests. That proves you already understand a lot about how SAS works. If you do that 10 or 12 hours, developing presentations, doing your research your presentations, doing all of the exercises, and all the other things you're doing, you are going to earn that certificate that uh, Mohsen is organising with SAS for this module, a joint SAS University of Derby certificate that says you are competent at SAS. That will help you get that job in your placement year with SAS organi uh, using organisations. In addition to getting, gaining the, the proficiency to, to be certified by SAS, so that would be on the top of that. Uh, I just want to... Uh, could we oh. go back to one important aspect of dealing with data is I might throw a data set at, at you, or you go to the net and download a data set. It's very important to create.
create some sort of a relationship between yourself and the data that you are trying to analyze. And the way to do this is by querying the data before you do any analysis. And there is one important proc that you should be able to use. Do you, do you remember what it is? Proc contact, uh, uh, contacts. This is very important. It gives you an insight into the structure of the data inside your data set. So that is number one. Number two is what if I throw at you a four million record data set? What do you think you want to do? Do you think you want to deal with all four million at the same time? No. What do you think you want to do instead? I'm presenting you with a four gig data set. What do you think you're going to do? Make it smaller. Just filter it out. Sorry? Just filter it out and make it smaller. I would shy away from the word filtered, but I would say something else, and I think this is what you mean. You mean to sample it, to get a smaller set, but yet that captures the whole concept, more or less. It's like going to a doctor and getting a, a blood test. The blood test, they get this much, but they put it into their machine, and they will be able to use that to have an insight into the inner works, uh, workings of your own body, your heart, your blood, whatever it is. So we need to have sampling. So the uh, product contents, as well as sampling the data, if it is so huge, that will give you some sort of an insight. Once you have a feel of how you can converse with that data set, then you can go ahead and do the rest of what you need. I mean, you already come across it in various bits. The obs equal will just chop the first 10, 20, 50, or 100 records or whatever. That's one way of doing it. You could also do it by just getting it to out a data step, which outputs every 10th record or every 100th record to get a, a, a longitudinal sample. There's lots of different ways of doing it. Um, uh, so many different ways. Again, explore them. And what most of them are saying is particularly valuable using prop content if the data set that you found out there is in SAS format already. And there are actually lots and lots of SAS formatted data sets available in the wild. You just have to go find, search for them. And what is the data, what's the file type of a SAS data set? Dot, what is it? Hmm? SAS lib, is it? Or is it something else? If you have a look in, uh, say in the 20 chapters, you can go and have a look at what the file type is for those, the files which are data, SAS data, because those will have a nicely constructed prop com, uh, contents already. Because people who are then exporting it, well, they've done a lot of work assembling it probably, so it'll have names, it might have labels, it might have in formats out and the other formats, and lots and lots of data that tells you what it's all about. So then you can do a prop contents, and it means an awful lot more. Whereas if you've just imported data from Excel and you've given it the row of uh, column type letter uh, names and so on, well, you already know it. So be sensible about when you use comp prop contents and when you don't. Um, I used to use it a lot when I was dealing with already created SAS data sets. But yeah, it's, you have to take it in context. Where did that data come from? Where did the prop contents get de developed? Is it on my machine when I imported it? Or was it on somebody else's when they exported the data as a, uh, spread, um, ex sorry, a SAS data set? Lots of different things. So think all about that. By the way, most of the mentioned storytelling, I shall put into the video list um, for this module, the YouTube playlist for this module, a link to a rather interesting TED uh, presentation about choosing appropriate graphical out, um, information or presentation and how to tell that story that does this bit. We found it last term, Dennis Parks found it for um, Emerging IT Product Development and I'm now putting it across the different um, playlist so each of you can get there. So the other things that you can do is you know where to find the playlist for this module if you look on YouTube for that, for my um, channel, you will find a whole lot of playlists for each of the modules I've taught over this semester and last semester. And you can explore those as well. 
There's lots of stuff there that you can look ahead to what you might be doing in a year or two years' time and see how that applies back to what you're doing now. Okay, folks? So now we've finished that, we're going to go on to the presentations. Um, I hope you've got um, memory sticks that you can plug into the PC here to show you your presentation. I will stay for the first one and then hand over to my good colleague over there uh, to coordinate the rest of them. We have here lots of sheets for you all to fill in, um, presentation by presentation. A few observations, your thoughts about each presentation. You'll need to put at the top um, which the topic is and kind of which group and fill, everyone will get a, a sheet and you'll fill it in about what I really liked about the project that the presentation was and then you can fill in a few lines there. And then the second box is I think that the session or presentation could have been uh, improved if dot 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 dot. So we want one suggestion from everybody that would help to make that a better presentation. So then you will learn how to do presentations even better. I think you've been doing some presentation work with Dennis in the last term or so, haven't you? Were yeah. you doing this term or last term? Last, last, term. last term. So you've got a lot of experience already about how to give good presentations. Let's see that it's paid off and you're going to give good presentations now. Okay, folks. And there's one thing that you notice, actually.